I wanted to, uh, in, in February of this year, uh, the February 7th, 17th issue of Christianity Today had an article in it called When, Ev- when Evangelism Really Isn't That Hard. It was written by a Dr. Jerry Root, and I, I read it this week and brought tears to my eyes, so I figured I'd share it with you. Uh, it kind of fits with what we're talking about this evening as we continue in Acts. So I'm just going to read you an excerpt from this article, again, it's from Christianity Today. Uh, Jerry Root is the guy, he says. He says, while my flight was delayed, I met a woman in the Vienna airport, and she was wearing a lanyard with a name tag and carrying a clipboard and obviously taking a survey for the airport. And when she came to me, I asked her what her name was. Allegra, she replied. Allegra, are you from Vienna? She answered, no, I grew up in southern Austria. And with that answer came the permission to ask, well, what brought you to Vienna? She said she was a student. This opened the door to more questions. Uh, Where did she go to school? What was she studying? After 20 minutes or so, I knew a good deal about Allegra. I knew her mother abandoned the family to go to Canada with her lover. I learned her father's bitterness was toxic. I learned her brother also attended the University of Vienna, but that they were estranged. When I expressed my sadness for what seemed to be a good deal of estrangement from the people closest to her, she said it was far worse than she had confided. She told me she had a boyfriend who went to study art in Florence for six months and asked her, to wait for him, and she did so. Her boyfriend had returned the very day before I met Allegra, only to inform her he met somebody better in Florence. Jerry writes, I knew where God was wooing her, and I know the deep felt need where Allegra was likely to hear the gospel. After 20 minutes, she had not asked me one question. So I said to her that I knew she had a survey to fill out, but that I had been sent to tell her something. She wondered if I was a plant put there by the airport to see if she was doing her job. I assured her it was nothing like that, but I had something to say to her once she finished her survey questions. So she rushed through the airport survey, then put down her pen, looked me in the eye, and eagerly asked, what were you supposed to tell me? And knowing that Allegra felt abandoned and betrayed, I said to her, Allegra, the God of the universe knows you and loves you. He would never abandon or forsake you. I said it to her again, Allegra, he loves you. Sometimes it takes three times before the words sink in, so I said it again, Allegra, he loves you. And after the third time, she burst into loud sobs. Everyone in the gate was looking in our direction, and through her tears, Allegra Allegra blurted out, but I've done so many bad things in my life. I responded, Allegra, God knows all about it, and that's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for all your sins and to bring you forgiveness and hope. I was explaining the gospel to ears willing to hear and a heart willing to receive. And as I read that story, I was reminded that this is the message that we all need. It's not a message that we just need at the beginning of our walk with Christ, but a a message that we need every day, day in and day out, as we are reminded that we don't deserve what we have been given. We are not good enough for God. We don't deserve that he would do this for us. In fact, we are only here because he has been good on our behalf, that Jesus Christ lived perfectly and went to the cross so that he could die in our place for the sins we deserved to be punished for. Our identity is the cross. We have nothing to claim on our own. We cannot say we are good people, only that Christ has made us right before God. And this is the message that Allegra needed to hear, but it's the message that the most religious-looking person you know needs to hear. Stop trying to be good enough for God. You never can be. Rest in his unconditional love. It's the message that you, the, the person with the worst looking life among us, the most disastrous life needs to hear. God loves you perfectly. But even as I share this message, which uh, to, is very familiar uh, to probably most of you, I understand that we all hear it with different ears. Jesus told a parable in the New Testament about a sower who went out and sowed seed and it fell on four different kinds of soil. And depending on the condition of the soil, people heard it and it bore fruit or didn't hear it. He was speaking of the proclamation of the kingdom of God. And this is the case with us as we hear God's truth. 
proclaimed. It is not the truth (laughs) that is changing from week to week or from first person to person. It is the state of our heart that determines how we will respond to it. And we're going to see that in Acts this evening. We're going to see this at play as Paul goes out and he continues to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And you will recognize this if you've told many people about Jesus, that the effective spread of the good news of Jesus Christ does not depend on man's wisdom, but on God's power. And we're going to see as Paul proclaims the message that the success of his ministry is totally reliant on God's power and not human wisdom. So please turn with me then in your Bibles uh, to Acts chapter 16. We're going to pick up, as we always do, where we left off last week. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we encourage you to bring yours uh, here that you might uh, follow along and frankly keep me in check, make sure that what I'm preaching is uh, consistent and in Scripture and not contrary to it. Um, We're going to be reading in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to take a fairly big chunk this evening, but we're going to do it in three smaller uh, portions. So uh, once you've found it, uh, we're going to read beginning in verse 6 of Acts chapter 16. And then they went, that is Paul and Silas, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them." Now, every time I read this passage in the past, in in my head, I get this picture. So if you're familiar with where we've been, uh, Paul and Silas are in the middle of Turkey, what is modern-day Turkey, and they are told that they wanted to go to Asia. And in my head, always this picture just popped up uh, north to Russia. Is that what they're trying to do? Uh, Until I did a little bit more reading this week. Uh, So what he is referring to is Asia as a Roman province. And the Roman province of Asia was the basically that western chunk of uh, Turkey, uh, we'll call it. And the blue line where this starts is approximately where they were at the beginning of this passage. Uh, They were headed west, and they were about to go into Asia, and then the Holy Spirit stopped them. So then they turned north, and they were going to go up uh, north to Bithynia, and then the Spirit of Jesus stops them again. And so they redirect over to the coast where Troas is, And then it is there that they get, that Paul gets this vision that sends them across the Aegean Sea over into Macedonia, modern day uh, Greece, where we're going to end up with the remainder of our passage for today. So to give you a little picture of where they're headed, that's what's going on. And and as we look at this, I want you to notice a few things. First of all, uh, it is God who directs them through this process, and God actually stops them from doing what they intend to do two times over before they move on. So first we're told the Holy Spirit forbids them to speak the word in Asia. It's like God says, I don't want you preaching to these people, which might strike us as a little bit odd unless we know that later on on Paul's third missionary journey, he's going to evangelize basically that whole region of Asia. The seven churches that are addressed in the book of Revelation are all in that province of Asia. So a, a, a growing and a thriving church will eventually be planted there, but God is saying to them, now's not the time. And so then we're told the spirit of Jesus won't let them go into Bithynia, And you'll notice there that the the title has been subtly changed, right? We had Holy Spirit, now described interchangeably as the Spirit of Jesus. And this is one of those Trinitarian references in the Bible where we look at it and we understand that we proclaim God as uh, one God in three persons, Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all fully God and yet still distinct persons, and so the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, if you will, that belongs to Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we can see a little evidence there of one of the major uh, tenets of our faith. Uh, If you've taken our Bethel Beliefs class, you'll have uh, heard this explained, perhaps in a little more depth, perhaps not. But the other thing I want you to notice here, other than the fact that we've got this Trinitarian sort of statement, is that as Paul and Silas go, they don't get the full picture of where they're headed at the time. They just hear God saying no. 
So they're off doing their thing, and God says no, and they stop, and they're like, okay, let's come up with another plan. They try this other plan. God says no again, and they obey a second time, and it's only after the second act of obedience that God finally gives Paul the vision of here's where you're going, to Macedonia. And this is so much how our lives work, isn't it? Like, we are, we are here, and we're just like, God, would you just tell me where, I, where I'm going to go? Can you just give me, like, the 10-year plan? Tell me where I'm going to be, and then I'll just go there, and we'll avoid all this roaming around in the wilderness in the meantime. Like, I just want to know where you want me to go. And we don't realize that that's not the way God operates with us. He gives us today's task today to obey. He tells us, obey now, because I think if he gave us a clear picture of where we were supposed to end up, we would totally miss his will in the meantime. We'd run so far ahead trying to make our own plans to get there that we would just really mess everything up along the way. Sometimes it is the little acts of obedience and the little detours that actually prepare us to be able to obey in the future. I was reading a message, maybe some teaching by G. Campbell Morgan, an old uh, favorite uh, preacher of mine. And he said, some people are stuck (laughs) for years and years and years not growing uh, because there is an act of obedience that they were asked to do 20 years ago that they have not yet fulfilled. And because of that act of obedience, they cannot go on to what is next until they will take the first step first. But as we look ahead and we wait and we want what is next, we miss what God has for us. I was in college. I had an epiphany one day. I was at some uh, worship gathering for college students. I think it was a sophomore in college. And I was just sort of like frustrated with college. I'm sitting there going like, God, why can't this just be over? Why can't I just be on to real life? And it was like, God just stopped me and said, you know what, Andy? You said that in high school. He said, why can't high school just be over so I can get to college and get on to the good stuff? And now you're in college and that's not the good stuff anymore. When's it going to stop? You're going to get a job. What are you going to do? Well, before I was in high school, I wanted to be college. I wanted college. I wanted a job. When I got a job, I just wanted to be Friday already, right? Or maybe retirement is the end in sight. And we just want to be there and we rush and rush and rush and we get ahead and we forget to live the life that God has called us to live and to obey today. I'm not sure. Maybe the perspective on this changes a little bit. I was talking to an older gentleman in our church a number of weeks ago, and he said, Andy, he said, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. And I think his perspective was maybe different, maybe the opposite, like, whoa, if life would just slow down a little bit, I could use some more of this. It seems to be escaping too rapidly slipping through my fingers. How tragic is it that we spend half our life wishing for tomorrow and maybe half of our life looking back towards the past and we never live today if we're not careful. God gives us today, always today. Hebrews says, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. Jesus said to his followers, don't be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow, that's got enough garbage of its own. (laughs) Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Yeah, enough things to stress about today. You don't need to stress about tomorrow's problems too. He said, obey today. And Paul and Silas, as they follow the Holy Spirit, it is just one act of obedience after another until finally they get to the place where God calls them over into Macedonia. And we're going to pick up reading there. Actually, we're going to read verse 10 again because we'll notice something interesting in a minute there. So verse 10, when Paul had seen this vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and we spoke to the women who had come together. 
One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I mentioned that we were going to read verse 10 for a reason. You'll note that Luke uses the word we to describe the group now that is on this trip. Up until this point, it has always been Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Paul, or or Paul and Silas. And now at this point, in, in chapter 16, verse 10, we see this first hint of we. The guy who's writing Luke and Acts is Luke. He's a physician. At some point, we know he has joined this missionary trip, and he is now going to rub shoulders with the guy he's writing about. And you'll notice in verse 11, as they talk about this voyage, it isn't like, and then we sailed from Troas to Philippi, but we get all these steps along the way. We made a direct voyage to Samothrace. The next day we went to Neapolis, from there to Philippi. And so we have a little bit more detail when when Luke is writing from the we. When he's talking about us, he fills in some more of these, like, just unique texture details. Some of his uh, seafaring voyages, you'll get, like, weather reports and things from Luke, because he has access to this extra data that he isn't having to go through a witness, somebody else's testimony, who is there. And so we know that Luke has joined them at this point, and he is a part of the crew. And when they get to Philippi, the way that he describes it as a leading city uh, in this region of uh, Macedonia has led some scholars to think that Maybe Luke was from Philippi. We don't actually know where he's from. He's probably a Gentile. And the thought is like, he talks the city up pretty well. (laughs) Could be a little bit of hometown pride. Here's Luke. He had gone, uh, he had met them in Troas perhaps and gone back to his hometown with them. Maybe even that's why uh, God had connected Luke to this trip. We're not sure. What we do know is that he describes Philippi as a leading city. It's a significant city. It is not the capital of Macedonia, but it is a Roman colony. And what happened in Rome, if you were a part of, like, if you were a part of Italy, the, the actual homeland, then your laws and specifically the taxes you paid were different from everybody else in the Roman Empire. You sort of had this special treatment. And Rome would select from time to time significant cities that had uh, had played a a real big role in advancing or administrating their empire, and they would make these cities colony cities, and they would give them the rights of a city from the mainland. So this city had some special identity as a Roman colony city. They had some special uh, sort of privileges that is going to, Uh, come in as a little bit of a point of interest in just a couple more verses as we move on. But I wanted to point it out now so that you understand they have come to the city. It's a big city. It's a significant city. But what we don't find there is a synagogue. What what we don't have is what Paul and Silas and, and Barnabas have done all the way up until this point. They go to a city. They find the Jews there in the synagogue because they already know Yahweh. And they're just explaining to him like, all this stuff that you used to, that you know and that you believed in, in your Torah and the law and the prophets, it all points at Jesus. Here's your Messiah. He's your Messiah. This was a natural starting point for them. So they always started in the synagogue. Well, when they get to Philippi, there's no synagogue. But they are going to trace out, are there any God-fearers here? Are there any people who believe in the Jewish God? And what they identify then is a place down by the river where some God-fearers meet for prayer. And so they head out of the city, they go down there, and here they meet a gathering of women. Which, if you look at it, really flies in the face of what many people mistakenly believe about Christianity, that somehow Christianity sets women as second-class citizens of some sort. What we have here in Philippi is this incredible uh, statement that we have a group of just women and Paul is going to bring his mission to them and and the, the main convert, the only named convert we get in Philippi here is Lydia. And she's a, a Gentile. She's from Thyatira. And because she is described as a, a purveyor of purple goods, which were luxury goods, she's rather successful apparently and she's probably... A single. She's probably not married. Because in those days, her connection to a husband would have probably been mentioned. And so we have Lydia, this uh, really 
um, successful, independent woman who is at the center of what God does in Philippi. Paul later is going to write to the Galatian church. He's going to say, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no socioeconomic status. There is no race. There is no gender that has special access to Christ. He opens his arms wide to all, and he says, come and be mine. And so we have this really remarkable woman, Lydia, who, as she hears this message, something fascinating happens. God opens her heart. And we can't miss this, that when Lydia comes to Christ, it is because, as Luke said, God opened her heart to hear this. It is so important for us to remember because uh, typically if if we as Christians, if we uh, acknowledge the fact that God has called all of us to be messengers of his kingdom, to be ambassadors of him, we fall typically into a couple of traps. Some people will think like, well, if I'm going to tell people about Jesus, I need to know all the arguments. (laughs) Give me all the facts. Like I'm going to go get a PhD in this stuff and apologetics so that if anybody comes, I'll be like locked and loaded. I'll have all the biggest weapons and I can just annihilate any complaint or argument that they might have. You might have met such a person, right? They're just so confident that they can talk anybody into being a Christian that they basically don't talk anybody into becoming a Christian because they just think it's a matter of arguing, which is not who Christ is. And so they get this overblown idea that they are capable just by their own sheer force of wisdom to convert people. That's not how the gospel works. The other side of the spectrum that we might fall off of if we buy this idea that it is our own wisdom and words that saves people is we might go on the other side and we might say, I don't know enough. I don't know enough things about Jesus to tell other people about him. Like, what if they ask me a question about this and I don't know the answer? That would be terrible. They wouldn't become a Christian, so I can't tell anybody about Jesus. I just, I'm not smart enough. And so we don't even try because it just seems too intimidating. But again, that's not how this works. One of my favorite passages in Scripture, actually one of the first ones that I memorized as an adult in college, uh, was 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And Paul describes how he came and evangelized the Corinthian church. Here's what he says. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. He said, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. My speech, my message were not with these plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul understands that if he argues people into believing things about Jesus in their head because he's got the best argument, that the next time a really good, strong, powerful argument in the other direction comes along, uh, he risks people walking away from Christ. Why is it? Because they've only sort of mentally assented to some facts about Jesus. They have not actually come into a relationship with Jesus. And he says the Christian faith is not just a matter of thinking things or knowing things or believing things, but is a matter of being connected to the life of Christ. That it is in our faith in Christ, our submission to him as Lord, that we are united to him. Jesus used the picture of a vine and branches. You're plugged in to him. It is something that God does by his power. And this really ought to encourage us. I just think weakness and fear and with much trembling. Well, I can do that. (laughs) I can tell people about Jesus with weakness and fear and much trembling with not really wise, eloquent words. I know who Jesus is. I can try to let people know what I have experienced and known of him. And that is the call to be ambassadors for Christ. Not to convince the whole world with great and high arguments but simply to speak. And if you will do so, you will find that eventually you will notice something remarkable happen where God opens somebody's heart and they just hear it. And sometimes they're hearing things that you're not even really saying. (laughs) And they hear them better than you're saying them. Because God is at work 
and their hearts. When God opens the life of someone, the words coming out of your mouth are not what saves them. It is God at work. And that is why you and I, all of us, are qualified, we're capable of proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ to those who are lost. The other thing I'll point out to you uh, before we read on to the next section here is how Lydia responds when she is saved. What does she do? She's baptized. She makes this big public profession, I belong to Jesus. And then she uh, Im- compels Paul and Silas to stay at her house. Right, So she's a wealthy woman. She's got this big household. She's evidently got space to put up the whole crew. And she says, if you really believe that I'm a Christian, I want you to come and stay at my house. And Luke says, uh, she prevailed upon us. Translation, Paul's like, no, no, that's not all right. And she's like, no, I'm serious. It's like, no, no, it's all right. She's like, I'm serious. Fine, okay. (laughs) So this woman is serious. She will be a partner in the gospel. From the very outset, her life is transformed. She is willing to make it public and to put her money where her mouth is. She submits her resources to the advancement of the kingdom. And this is a sign of genuine faith. The reformers used to say, it is faith alone that saves us, but it is not faith that is alone. If your faith does not come with works, it's not genuine faith. So it's a remarkable then series of events. They go down to the river and and this uh, woman is saved and her whole household with her and she puts them up. Now they got a base of operations. They're going to go out and save the rest of the city of Philippi. Or so we might expect. We're going to find out what happens as they continue their mission here. So verse 16. So as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul then, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And so the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So this girl who is chasing them around as they go around the city, she has what is described in the Greek basically as a a, a python spirit. The idea is this is the, the kind of spirit that was thought to be the power behind the oracle at Delphi, where the Greeks had in their pagan practice where the gods thought you could go and hear from the gods this vision of the future. It's that same kind of spirit. This was legitimate demonic activity. And so as she's following Paul and Silas around, she's got this, uh, what the, the Greeks would have considered to be evidence of their pagan religion. And as she proclaims they're servants of the Most High God, they probably would have heard that as a reference to Zeus, who they called the Most High of the Gods. So here we have this demonic spirit who's really actually telling the truth that they are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming the way of salvation. But everybody most likely would have seen this as evidence that their pagan gods are confirming each other, that you've got the one oracle proclaiming that Zeus is at work in these guys and here's how to get his blessing. So Paul doesn't really want this. He doesn't need this. It is not necessary to get help from demons in his evangelism. But for a while, for many days, we're told, he ignores this spirit. He ignores this girl. And finally, he just can't take it anymore. So he's just like, whatever. And he turns around, he casts out this demon. Now, as I look at this, I go, like, why does Paul wait so long? Like, why would he go around for many days with his girl behind him? Like, these are the most high God servants, you know. Why would he put up with that until you realize, oh, wait, He is doing ministry this whole time. He's proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ. And it's not until he actually casts out this demon that that he's thrown in jail, that he's arrested and beaten and put in prison. 
I think what's going on here is this demon has been picking a fight for days, trying to get Paul to respond. And he has been ignoring it because he's about the matters of the kingdom. And once he turns to it, he knows he has all authority under heaven (laughs) to cast out this demon. He knows that in Christ, he has perfect authority. He's not afraid of this demon. He's tolerating it. There's no doubt in his mind that he can make it go away. And so he does. He just casts it out. The demon leaves. And that's when the sparks fly. You'll notice that up until this moment, nobody cares. Nobody cares about uh, Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas, sorry, uh, preaching the gospel. Nobody cares that they're teaching people about Jesus. It's like everybody just kind of ignores them. There's no resistance. There's no synagogue, so there's no Jews who are like, hey, you're entrenched, you're encroaching upon our territory. So there's no religious resistance from the Jews like in all the other cities. There's no political resistance. He's not creating this like mob that the city is afraid of. Uh, Nobody cares until somebody gets hit in the pocketbook. Because this woman with her oracle, she can tell the future. That's worth good money. And she's a slave, so all that good money belongs to her owners. And so they are making a serious profit off her. And when she loses this demonic spirit, she can no longer do that. All of their income is just it's up in smoke. So what are they going to do? They're going to flip out. <laughs> and what this reveals to us is that the offense of the cross, the reason people will get angry over the proclamation of Jesus Christ comes down to the question of how does it treat their object of worship? We're all made to be worshipers. We all have these things that we choose to seek after that we we think they, they make our life have meaning. They give us purpose. They're our identity. They're those things that we, that we love, that we hold on to, that are, that are very near and dear to us. And we live to, to gain more of these things or to protect them or to glory in these things. It could be our money. It could be our, our status. It could be our uh, a true love that we want. It could be an easy life. And the reality is, as long as Jesus will let us have those things, we got no problem with Jesus. So everybody loves gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Everybody loves the prosperity preacher's Jesus because the prosperity preacher's Jesus says, if you worship money and you call upon Jesus, he will give you more money. He will give you more of the object of your worship. Or if you worship success and you pray to Jesus in the right way, Jesus will get you a promotion. He will give you your object of worship. He will give you your idol. Or if, or if you haven't met the right person and you just name it and claim it, then, then a gentle Jesus will give you what you have based your meaning in your life around, this object of worship. And so the world doesn't really have a problem with fake Jesus. But the reality is, is that Jesus will not share his glory with another. God does not share the place of worship with other things. And if you will approach, if you will respond to Christ, he will take whatever is your object of worship and he will displace it. He will get rid of it. He will remove it. And he alone will be your object of worship. And this is where people get mad. Because the thing that I loved and I found so much meaning in has been denied me. In the case of Acts here, it is these men's income. They don't care about Jesus as long as Jesus isn't messing with business. But once Jesus casts out a demon, once Jesus asserts his authority and proclaims his rightful place, then the sparks are really going to start to fly. You see, my friends, the real Jesus is a threat to our idols. The real Jesus might ask you to sell everything and give it away. He said to one rich young ruler, if you lack one thing, go, sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And you know what? the rich young ruler went away sad because his object of worship, his wealth, would not be displaced. He wasn't willing to set it aside and have Jesus. Or Jesus might cost you some close relationships that you have, maybe some family members even. Jesus said, don't think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
If one of you comes after me, he says, it will create this rift in your family among those who will not worship me. The real Jesus, the dangerous Jesus, will demand that we give up our idealized dream for our life and that we set it aside and we say, God, you define what my life will be. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You see, when the real Jesus shows up, we find out in a hurry what we are worshiping. Because those things that create the biggest defensive response in our life are the places where our hearts are set. Now here's the unique thing about this. As I read this, I find it just fascinating. This has been my experience with just normal human nature. Is that when our idols are challenged, we won't stop and say, oh no, wait, that's my idol. Nobody says, oh wait, stop that. Don't tell me about what I had to do with my money because I'm greedy and selfish, right? Nobody's ever going to say that. Uh, When our idols are challenged, when our objects of worship are challenged, we respond uh, by basically grabbing any complaint that we can have at hand. So look at at what these people do here, right? We know that these men had a a slave girl, and the demon's been cast out of her, so the real problem is they're not going to get this money anymore. And what do they do? In In their claims, when they bring them before the magistrates, they're doing this. First of all, they're appealing to anti Semitism. Hey, these men are Jews. Our city, right? We don't like Jews here. These men are some of them. They said they're disturbing our city. They're going to appeal to the sense of community spirit. Like, we're, you know, we're not really upset about anything except we like peace in our city. Don't you guys like peace in our city? Because these other guys aren't going to get it for us. And so they'll attack that. Then they'll turn to something else. They say they advocate customs that are not lawful us as Romans to accept or practice. Now we're going to go for the patriotism angle. Or we say, hey, remember, we're the special Roman colony. We're good Romans. And even Rome knows it. And he's given us the status as Rome. And these men, they're, they're telling people to do, anti, frankly, anti-Roman things. So we need to deal with this problem. And the only thing they don't bring up is, oh, by the way, they cost us some money. That's really why we're angry. They didn't care that they were Jews. They didn't care about the customs they were teaching. They didn't care about any disorder. There was no disorder. But once their idol was challenged, they reacted, and they pinned it on all those other things. You know what, my friends? If you are a messenger of Jesus Christ, if you try to introduce people to Jesus, sooner or later you'll offend somebody if you do it right. Not that we go trying to offend people, But if you challenge somebody's object of worship, like if somebody loves money and you mention that Jesus is going to rewrite the way they think about money, or if somebody worships success or comfort or pleasure or pride or maybe even like a specific theological system, like if if Jesus would challenge those things, people get protective. It's the old mama bear syndrome. Like you can mess with any other thing over there. You can even throw sticks and rocks at me. I don't really care, but you touch my cub, it's on. And we find our, when our objects of worship are touched, we get real defensive in a hurry. And it is a sign to us whether or not we recognize it or whether or not we recognize it in the person we're talking to that we have just touched upon an idol. And it's always going to come out other ways. Somebody's going to say, why are you so intolerant? They're not really caring that much about your intolerance except it's intolerant against what they think ought to be right, or or you have no right to judge, or they'll say, you know what, I don't care about me, I'm just standing up for justice. So what you said, that's, frankly, that's anti-American, how dare you do that? And the point is, they're, they're trying to protect what has just been challenged, which is precious to them. And as you encounter the real Jesus, you will fall on one side or the other. Like, you will get to this point where you learn something about Christ, and frankly, it will appear to you to be offensive, or maybe even insulting, because God wants to take something that is in the worship portion of your life and move it out of there and put Jesus there instead, and we don't like to do that because those things are precious to us, and some people 
would maybe even in that moment decide to walk away from Christ rather than give up what they hold most dear. On the other side, if you will embrace Christ and if you will worship him truly and fully, people around you will eventually take offense to that. Because they will see in your rightful worship of Jesus Christ what they are worshiping is not true. And as you speak of Christ and as you call people to him, they are challenged to give up what they truly love. And so here as we look at this, you'll notice that Paul and Silas, they don't fight back. They're beaten. They're arrested. They're beaten. They're thrown in jail unjustly. It's trumped up charges, right? They're thrown in there. They're even put in the stocks because they're so dangerous criminals, you know, they can't get away. We've got to lock up their feet too. And so they're locked up. And it seems to be sort of hopeless. We'll get the end of the story next week. But as I read this and I look at it, I understand that the lesson that we're to get here is not here's how you fight against resistance, but the message really is that you ought to res expect resistance. If you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, tell other people about Jesus, it will be benign most of the time until you touch that nerve, that idol, and then it'll get nasty probably sooner or later. Now the great news is this. Jesus told us to expect this. And he actually said it's a mark of looking like him. But he didn't just say that people will resist us. Here's what he said in John 15. He says, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. So if they persecuted me, if you're my servant, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. You should expect it. However, he said, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. That is the message of life that we have been given that we as ambassadors of Jesus would go out and we would expect, like Jesus, to be met with both resistance when hearts are hard and idols are challenged, but also when God opens hearts with this full-fledged embrace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need the perfect words of the greatest wisdom. We just need to go. In the day that Jesus says, don't go that way, we stop and don't go into Asia. And we redirect, and when God says, no, this is not your time to go up into Bithynia, we say, okay, I won't go there. And we continue to obey day after day, and as he brings opportunities before us, we speak, and we expect that the success of our mission will not depend on our wisdom or our plans, but on God's power. And so I would encourage you, as God's people, to do that. To take a little step of faith and wait, understanding that yes, you will likely sooner or later receive resistance. But yes, also, as messengers of a, of a message and a life that transforms, you will also be able to witness the most incredible, beautiful thing the world has ever known when people are brought from death into life. There is no better experience as a Christian than to watch somebody who formerly stood condemned, receive what God has done on their behalf at the cross. You will have no greater joy than the world, frankly, cannot wait. Let's pray. God, we rejoice that you have brought us to Christ, not because we deserved it or we were good enough, but because you were love. And God, that... Our effectiveness as your ambassadors doesn't depend on our wisdom or on, or on words. That you will work through us, God, but not because of us. That it is your spirit that transforms lives. And we thank you that you have invited us into that process and you have made us messengers. And we ask, God, that you would give us opportunities and that you would give us direction so that we will see when you intend us to speak. And we ask that you would give us the courage to speak and to trust that your power, that your spirit will bear fruit even as we obey. In Jesus' name we pray.